Welcome to Self and Soul from the Sanctuary of Self, Rosicrucian Order Library, Part 1 of 2 on Words of Wisdom. The ancient mystical order Rosicrucis, also known as the Rosicrucian Order, AMORC, is a worldwide cultural, educational, and philosophical organization that is perpetuating the profound and practical teachings of the Rosicrucians. These teachings, as passed down and added to over the centuries from ancient Egypt to Europe and now all over the world, pertain to the mysteries of the universe, nature, and humans themselves. The Rosicrucian Library is a source of spiritual wisdom and insight that includes the important writings by the respected imperators of the order, such as Dr. Harvey Spencer Lewis, Ralph M. Lewis, and Christian Bernard. Today, we will read from Chapter 3, Self and Soul, from Part 1, entitled The Mysteries, in Frater Ralph M. Lewis's book, The Sanctuary of Self, a detailed and comprehensive explanation is offered in this chapter on the nature of consciousness and human's awareness. Self and Soul Notwithstanding the multitude of phenomena that humans experience, they can, for our purposes, be classified into two general divisions, physical and non-physical. The first classification consists of those realities, objects, and events which man can perceive by means of his sense receptor faculties, namely his eyes, ears, etc. Obviously, such realities, so far as our consciousness of them is concerned, have a dependence upon our physical organism as our nervous system and brain. The second classification consists of those perceptions or experiences which are the result of consciousness of self. These are quite distinct from physical experiences. You do not exist to yourself just because you see your body or can't touch your limbs. In fact, if you were deprived of all of your physical receptor faculties, you would still have a realization of yourself. It is commonly said that we feel self, but such is a very similitude, the appearance of truth. The fact is that the sensations of self are not like those we derive from the touch of an object. To self, there are no sensations of hot, cold, hard or soft, nor are there sensations of pain or pleasure. You realize that you are you, quite aside from such experiences. This consciousness of self, then, is a consciousness of our consciousness. The human is impregnated with a mysterious vital life force. We conceive that intelligence is an attribute of this life force, or that it is at least integrated with its functioning. Patently, then, this indwelling intelligence also exists in the cerebral neurons or brain cells, wherein it provides a sensitivity to those impulses which come to us through our sense organs from the world outside ourselves. In the brain, in other words, this life force and intelligence makes possible our physical experiences amounting to our objective consciousness.
In addition, the highly sensitized organ of brain can and thus become conscious of the sensitivity of this vital life force and intelligence existing throughout the whole being of man. The origin of these latter sensations, it is apparent, is entirely immanent. They are in no way related to the sense organs and the outside world. The function is similar to an extremely delicate instrument made to detect exterior motions, but which is likewise, because of its sensitivity, able to discern the fine movement of its own mechanism. The consciousness has thresholds. By thresholds, we mean the points at which certain effects or sensations begin to occur in the brain. The thresholds for the impulses of sound and sight, for example, are considerably lower than those of the vague impressions of self. Consequently, it is comparably easy to lose a realization of self if the grosser impulses of the sense organs dominate the consciousness of the brain. In other words, if the consciousness is exposed to a bombardment of sounds and an excitation of visual impressions, we know from our own experience that we lose momentarily a realization of self in these physical perceptions of the objective consciousness. Only when the thresholds of the receptor senses are partially blocked or suppressed do we become fully aware of those more subtle impressions which reach the higher thresholds of the brain consciousness and which we experience as self. It is quite cogent that without a highly developed organ such as the human brain, self would not exist to each of us. This does not mean to convey the idea that brain is the cause of self, nor that self is dependent upon that organ. Brain, however, is the channel by which we come to know self. It is the instrument by which our varied impulses are integrated into that notion, that state of consciousness, which we define as self. For analogy, a large telescope is not the cause or creator of a nebula millions of light years distant. It is, however, the means by which we come to discern the existence of the nebula. It has been proved that when you remove the brain or completely inhibit its functioning, you have not destroyed the elements of self which pervade the human, but merely the means by which we exist to ourselves. Without brain, the function of self in man would be much like the simple consciousness, which exists in a blade of grass. The intelligence associated with the life force in each cell of our being would function, but there would be nothing in which it would be mirrored. As the brain reflects externalities and existences that are outside of us, it likewise reflects the world within, namely self. The introversion of this consciousness of brain, its response to the inner sensitivity, is what is commonly referred to as its subconscious functioning. To the mystic, consciousness, the state of awareness, is existence. To man, that which he is conscious of is. All the powers the human is capable of exerting, whether physical, mental, or psychical, can be related only to that of which he has knowledge that which is real to him. 
For analogy, in target shooting, if there is more than one target, a choice may be made as to which one to shoot at. If but one target can be preserved, that then becomes the object of the participants' efforts and whole attention. The mystic knows, however, that the realities of his consciousness are dual. Those things or particulars which have an objective existence as his body and the external world, and those realities of his consciousness that are inner perceptions arising from deep within himself as emotions, moods, inspirations. This latter may become an impetus which will cause him to have objective experiences, but their origin seems confined to the ethereal nature of his being. To the mystic, the only separation that exists is this duality of his consciousness, the inclination to make a distinction between the realities of self and those of the objective world. Actually, the mystic understands that all these realities are part of one great hierarchical order, a graduated scale. Degradation is according to the simplicity or complexity of their nature. The more complex the realities, the greater is their manifestation of the one universal intelligence. In other words, the more they represent the entire hierarchical or cosmic order. The activities of self, the realities of our inner being, are more complex in this sense than are those particulars of the material or everyday world which we experience. If, for analogy, the cosmic order or God, whichever you please, is the synthesis of everything, then that God obviously is complex, infinite in substance and in variety. If we become conscious of the complex or the greater evolvements or manifestations of his nature, the closer is our intimacy with him, the more of him we experience.